GSMF today. And uh, we just want to give blessings to each and every one. We know there's a lot of things happening in the world. We know a lot of things are going on. And uh, you got to remember, the enemy never tires to ruin our days. The enemy never tires to ruin our day. We get tired. The enemy doesn't. Neither does the Holy Spirit ever get tired of wanting to help us and change our day. Or even our life in general. Remember, you have a guardian angel. You have a guardian angel standing around you. His purpose is to watch you over, to protect you, to keep you going. That's awesome. He only works, or they only work for you as long as you allow them to work for you. They only work for you as long as they, you allow them to work for you. How does that work? When you grumble, complain, argue, fight, hate, and you can continue on with that situation on those types of attitudes, you close the door. You tie their hands, and they can't help you. So if the door is closed and their hands are tied, what happens? You've got a demon that stands around you as well. And guess what happens? You just allowed them to come help you. I'd rather have my guardian angel help me long over the fact than having the demons help me. See, and you say, well, how does demons help you? They come to kill, to steal, and destroy. It's like the time that I was up there in Ankeny getting gas. And I normally don't have a problem, but for some reason, after I was getting the gas pump, I went back to open the door up and it was locked. Needless to say, the key was in the ignition. And I don't remember locking the door. But sometimes when I get out of the car, I touch the, the handle on the door and I must have locked it, not thinking that. So I waited until Debbie and Sarah showed up a little bit later to open the door so I could get out. Well, luckily, there, I could go in this, the, the building inside. The lady was nice enough, the attendant, to let me go in. But it kind of ruined my day. I don't know if I did anything wrong or caused a problem or what happened. But sometimes these things happening, and you might look back and say, oh, yeah, I grumbled, I complained, I argued, I fought. I had something happen that just kind of caused me to go bad, something I know I'm not supposed to do and I've done. And you'll see and watch those things go on. So just to let you know, just always remember, it's just something that you got to remember. They never tire to destroy you. The devil never tires. You think, well, one day the, the attack will be off. No. The only way the attack comes off is when you go to heaven. But God has given you the Holy Spirit to where you can withstand and destroy. And you can have victory over everything. Praise the Lord. I just felt that song with victory was a, a good time to hit and go with it. Because he wants to give us victory. If you go to Philippians 4.4. 4, King James Version. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request, request be known unto God. We're supposed to sit here and say, Oh, Lord, we got a problem. Oh, Lord, you need to do that. Oh, Lord, wow, why is not things happen? Isn't that thanksgiving? No, that's not thanksgiving. God doesn't go with whining or begging. He, he performs his word. According to his word. The Bible says, enter boldly in before the throne of God. So sometimes we like to get into the, the begging and the, and the whining and all that. And it isn't that what the Lord wants. He wants thanksgiving. 
Father, I thank you for what's going on. I thank you for the things that are happening. I thank you that you can overcome. See, God will make a way out. I taught on that a long time ago. I should probably teach on it again. God has made a way out of everything that you're in. Everything. I've said it many times. I'll be dealing with some people, working in some situations, and all of a sudden, I just throw my hands up and said, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. I can't see anything good coming out of this. There's nothing here. I don't know. I, I just give up. It's your problem. Thank you. I don't know how you're going to do this, but it's your problem. Every single time, he changes it. And I, I sit there bewildered saying, how do you do this? Because <laughs> he's God. Because <laughs> I finally gave it to him. Sometimes you have to give it to God. And sometimes there's things that you can't do. Only God can do it. But see, you have to be thankful. And I, I was thankful at that time. I was thankful that God would be able to do it because I couldn't handle it anymore. But I was thankful that he can do it in all those situations. But it says, but with thankful, thankfulness, or thankfully, giving or let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Jesus Christ. Now, if you've never really felt that peace that passes without understanding, the first time I got slain in the spirit, I was laying there. I figured when you get slain in the spirit, it was like me, just going crazy. And the Holy Ghost was all over, and it just like, and I laid there on the floor, just, wow, now I understand peace that passes understanding because I can't understand anything about the peace that I just got. So praise the Lord. I got a full understanding about the peace that passes all understanding. There's no way you can understand the peace. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the chaos, if you turn it over to God, guess what's going to happen? You get peace. It might look horrible, but you got peace. Every single time, if you will do that. It's the peace that passes without understanding. You can't understand it, but God will do it. He'll bring it through you. Say, There's no way anything good can come out of this, but God will give you peace over the whole situation. If you know what his word says, his word says, all things worketh for the good of those who love him. Wow, I've seen some things that doesn't look like it's ever going to be good. But what happens? They worked out for the good of it. Because, see, I love God. He says, all things worketh for the good of those who love him. If you love God, guess what? He's going to work it out good for you. Brethren, finally, brethren, whichsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there are any virtue, if there are any other pra uh, praise, think on these things. Wow. How often do you do that? How often do you think that? How do you keep your peace? How do you keep your peace? Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there are any virtue, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on those things. How often do you think on those things? Or do you think about how bad the government is? Do you think how bad your situation that you're dealing with at work at? Are you thinking about, wow, I just don't know what's, what's going on in this situation or that situation with my family? And do you think about that? You know, why did this happen? Why does that happen? Are you thinking about it? Yes, we need to take some time to evaluate things that are going on. But if you start thinking a whole lot about it, it'll start to bring you down. But when you start to think on the good things, you open up the door for the Holy Spirit to bring you peace. You know, it's amazing because when I went back to Ephesians 5.10, Ephesians 5.10, it says, try to find out what 
is pleasing to the Lord. What is pleasing to the Lord? I know uh, Pat over there one day said, God hates violence. I think it was Pat that was saying that. Did you say that once, Pat? I'm sure you did. Because <laughs> it stuck in my mind that you did. But the reality was, he hates violence. Wow. So that's not very peaceful to think about violence. Hurting somebody. Telling somebody off. I used to think about that once in a while in my mind. That was wrong. But see, it happens sometimes. You get so mad, upset, you just open up the door for the devil to come in and help you out. Wow. Whereas if you had your guardian angel there, he'd be protecting you and keeping you safe. It says, try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. The only way you're going to find out what's pleasing to the Lord when you start to read the Word of God and find out what, it, what His Word says. It says, take no part in worthless deeds and evil and darkness. Well, that's, that's pretty well known to most people who believe in God. But then it even said, instead rebuke and expose them. It is a shame even to think about them or things that ungodly people do in secret. Wow, let alone talk about it. Wow. What do you think about this? It is shameful even to talk about things that ungodly people do in secret. Whew. That's a heavy word, if you really think about that. How many times you talk about somebody, well, they did this and they do that and this is bad and that's bad. If you are discussing something because you want to pray about it, be very careful that it doesn't become gossip. But if it's not gossip and you truly have a heart for them and you're going to pray for them, not you're going out and tell everybody about it because you don't do that, that's gossip. But if you're dealing with it yourself or you're you're dealing with God and you're, you're praying about it, and that's fine. But when you start to do this, just talking about, I, you know, I never thought of that before. I, was, I just got a revelation one day. Just talking about the things that the ungodly people do in secret. It's shameful. Why? Because, see, God's wanting the holy people. God wants to have mind locked on him and not on the evil stuff. What happens is God wants us to get in such a way when you see something going wrong or you know something's going wrong, you take the Word of God. You're thinking on the Word of God. You're understanding the Word of God. It takes place and precedence over this other stuff. And immediately you speak out the Word of God over that situation so he can release the angels to go in and the Holy Spirit and his Word will go in and start to change that situation. Good example. It just came back to me because I never had that in my notes, but it's just something the Holy Spirit dropped back in my mind. There was a church down in Texas, I believe they were talking about, and they had this young man that got on drugs and he fried his brain. He was in a lockup in a padded cell because of what was going on. He was, so he hurt himself. And everybody in the church says, we'll pray for him. So they got together and they start praying. Everybody start praying for this young man. A year or two went by. Many of the people backed off. There was a few praying for him. Finally, there only came down to one person that was praying. It was a young or older lady. And she kept praying and praying and praying and praying over this young man. One day in church, the door opened up, and here this young man come walking down the hallway. They weren't talking about the drugs they took. Wasn't talking about how bad it was. Didn't talk about his, his childhood. Didn't talk about all this stuff. They just kept praying the word of God and believing God for doing what a miracle, what needed to be done. One person praying the word of God over that young man. When everybody else gave up, that young man come through the door. Came down and, and gave his testimony. He says, I was in that room 
And all of a sudden, this bright light and the power of fire that came down upon me and totally changed my life. His brain was perfect. But if we've been complaining about it, you know, he wouldn't be in there because if he hadn't taken drugs, if they hadn't beat him up, he must have had something going on in their childhood. Something's wrong with that place. There's something's wrong with that family. All those children, they have problems. Yes, we can see it. But it's shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. There's an anointing here that's strong. The power of God is trying to get through on some situations and understandings. I must have erased my email because I had one that I was going to have read. It was from the Liberty Council. And the issue was about California and what was happening with their churches out there. They're trying to cancel church. They're trying to get people to where they, you know, they're telling them that making laws that they can't worship. You know, because of COVID and all this stuff. There's another organization out there that people know about, and they've even turned, and they, their leaders said that we're against church. We want to shut all churches down. And, I mean, they're all working against the churches out there. In fact, there's people, there's laws there. If you have church, we're going to throw you in jail. I guess there have been some pastors who been thrown in jail. One church says, I don't care, we're going to have church. In fact, the, the persecution was changing things so much they're getting more people coming in. I don't know, they had several people. I don't know, remember the actual report you might have heard about in California. They went out in the ocean and baptized all these people. Yeah. Under the midst of, they couldn't do that. They kept pushing towards, they keep pushing. And several churches are under fire. Praise God we're not doing that here in Iowa. But it could come this way if we don't watch what's going on. But we have the authority right now to start to pray over and break that down. That's why I said the enemy never tires from trying to ruin your day. To ruin what's going on in church. To ruin all these things that are happening. So I just want you to know that these things that are going that way, you have to be very careful and make things happen because of what's going on. Praise the Lord. We just give you glory, Father, for all that's happening. And we thank you for the protection over us, what's happening here. So just remember that God is really watching and taking care of and making things happen. He's keeping us safe through those areas as we continue to walk with him. Also, I had, uh, I had a... Sid Roth video that popped up on my phone, so I watched it because this man, Kevin is Z A D A I Zadik, I think. He took and he had a five hour face to face encounter with Jesus. Which he spoke with the next about the next eleven years. I took and I sat here and I said one thing. When I went that way, I, I felt I was supposed to buy the video, or the, you know, the, the CDs, which I did. I bought the CDs. I put them on. I started to walk through there. And then all of a sudden what happened was I started to realize everything he was talking about in the first two CDs is what I've been teaching the last two weeks. It's about Ephesians. And I'm thinking, whoa. I haven't had a five-hour encounter with Jesus, but I've had several years of being with the Holy Spirit, asking him for him to figure out. And I'm thinking, wow, here's a man that's been there five hours, five and a half hours, I think it was, with face-to-face -face with Jesus, and it's the same revelation that I have. I thought that was an encouragement to me. To know it's not me, it's God. And what he wants to put out is exactly what's happening. So that's what, I've never done this really that much before, and that's been following through Ephesians, through, a, you know, a book of the Bible, and just kind of speaking about it as we went along. But again, today we're going to start out with Ephesians 5, and we'll just take and have Debbie read that. Again, we won't have it up on the wall. We'll just have uh, Debbie read it. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, 
Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Did you read it out of this one? Oh. <laughs> I was say, you don't want me to read it out of my word? <laughs> that's a different version. Wait a minute, I don't know. First page on the bottom. Got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I get carried away sometimes. I love my Bible so much. Uh -huh. Let's start over again. Ephesians 5, 1, living in the light. Follow God's example in everything you do because you are his dear, dear children. Live a life filled with love for others, following the example of Christ, who loved you and gave himself as a sacrifice to take away your sins. God was pleased because the sacrifice was like sweet perfume to him. Verse three, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be a thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, I want to talk about that a little bit. Inheriting, inherit the kingdom of, of Christ or God. I think in the King James it says a kingdom of God. When you start to realize what the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God, as we talked about before, is the Spirit. When Jesus, and this is what the Lord had showed me when we were driving down the truck one time, just for a revelation, when Jesus poured out the Spirit onto the earth, immediately heaven came down upon the earth. That became the kingdom of God. It is the same thing as the kingdom of heaven, except for there's a variation. I think it was in Psalms that said that the, uh, the heavens is of the Lord or for the Lord, but the earth was given to the, the uh, children of the earth, to his children. In other words, the earth was given to his children. So what happens is when you start to look at it, there's a division, but yet there isn't a division. Because in four, we already said there's only one God, one Jesus, one hope, one love, you know, one baptism. And we're all one in the Spirit. We're all one in the Spirit. So when you're in the Spirit, it's like you're there immediately, but you're not there because, see, there's a difference in the physical understanding. We're physically here on this earth. It's, when you go back into it, it's about the seen and the unseen. If you go back in and start understanding that one, because, see, the unseen is God and, and the Spirit. The seen is us. And he wants to rule this earth, which is seen by the unseen, by the Holy Spirit in us, so that we as a seen can rule over this earth. It can confuse you when you go back through that, especially that saying that we have about the seen and the unseen. But the thing is, you have to realize, if you do not enter into or inherit the kingdom of God here, when what well, we believe in the kingdom and the rapture, in, in Thessalonians 2, it says, until he is taken away. The, the, you know, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until he is taken away. When he gets taken away, who is he? We are. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is holding the devil back. In a kingdom, yep, that's interesting. In a kingdom, what happens is you have a, a king... And you have a prince. The prince is under the king. And as long as the king's there, guess what? The prince has no authority. But when, as soon as you take and, and you end up having, you know, when, when the king's gone, then the prince has all authority. Who's the devil? The prince of power of the air. Who are we? According to Revelation 5, 6, we are the king. King and the priest. He's given us a kingdom. Given us a kingdom. See, we already inherited the kingdom. But if you come down and you start to see all these things that it talks about, it says that you will not inherit the kingdom. So if you're not inheriting the kingdom and you're not walking in the kingdom, when God comes back and says, okay, I'm going to take my spirit out of here, because Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you, then it comes down to the same thing with the uh, virgins, the ten, that were the ten virgins, five were ready, five weren't. And immediately what happened was, 
when that happened, boom, the five that were ready were gone because they met the bridegroom and they went to heaven and they had a, the Lamb's Supper preparing to come back down. So when you're looking at it from a kingdom understanding, it's different because without the kingdom, there, we, there's a lot of discussion about, the, about post, pre, and mid. You can see everything in the Bible to say, yes, this is exactly what it is without the kingdom. With a king, kingdom understanding, there's only one way of looking at it. And that is, you're here, you've been given the authority and power over the enemy, just as Adam had been given the authority over the, the whole land. The devil had no legal right whatsoever until he had, when they sinned, and the, and the Spirit of God left and went to heaven. That's why Jesus released that same Spirit that Adam lost down upon us so that now we can walk in that way. This is one of those areas, if you have a full understanding of that, you'll see what's going on. But I just want to hit this real quick. All these people that are doing these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A lot of them don't have a relationship with God. A lot of these people that are doing these things that have accepted Jesus Christ are part of the virgins that are not prepared to ready when, when, the, uh, when the bridegroom comes. They don't have enough oil. They have not spent time to be with God. This is what I keep hearing all the time. The lukewarm are in trouble. They have to change. God's done with them. If you don't change now, you've got a problem. You won't inherit that kingdom. You won't be in the kingdom when the, when the kingdom gets removed. And the Antichrist is revealed. You don't want that. That's not a good thing to have happen. So that it's really time to get your life caught up with the Lord and make it going and be hot for the Lord instead of cold so he won't spit you out of his mouth. Right there. For a greedy person is really an idolater who worships the things of this world. Do not be fooled by those who try to excuse their sin for the terrible anger of God comes upon all those who disobey him. Don't participate in the things of these people. For though your heart were once full of darkness, now you are full of light from the Lord, and your behavior should show it. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, rebuke and expose them. It is shameful even to talk about these things that ungodly people do in secret. But when the light shines on them, it becomes clear how evil these things truly are. And where your light shines, it will expose their evil deeds. That's why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you the light. Praise the Lord. See, we talked about that a little bit already. About uh, It's shameful even to talk about the things that the ungodly people do in secret. But it also says down here, and where your light shines, it will expose their evil deeds. And this is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you the light. See, that's where it comes down to. Are you complaining about what's going on in a person's life? Are you talking about how bad things are? Are you always saying this person, that person, whatever? Are you actually taking the light of the Word of God and speaking over that person, speaking over that situation, proclaiming that as it goes along? See, one of the reasons we don't have as many people fully delivered is because we are talking kind of behind their back, you might say, or talking about the situation instead of talking about what God can do in their life, what God needs to put in the Word of God over them. When the body of Christ starts to go into that position, then you're really going to see some tremendous things happen in people's lives, even greater than they had before. And there are people out there that, you know, I've, I've been told about, and I just said, hey, it's up to God. And what happens is we start praying, I start praying over them, that word, or start speaking the word over and saying, God, you got to do it, because I can't. There's no way I can do anything. So it also says that, the heart of the king. Who's the king? We are. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And you can't move anybody's will. 
but the Lord can. He can come in and start to change a person's heart, change their will, their desires, and bring them into the place where they need to be. So when you're talking about something, instead of taking it before the Lord and letting him discern it, and that's what's got to be happening, the more we do it that way. We start complaining about this, complaining about that. Hey, forget it. Take it to the Lord. And ask God to deal with that issue. Ask God to change that situation. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to start to, God will start to work to put light down on that situation, expose if there's something there, and then start to clean it up if the person's willing to do it. That's the biggest thing. We've talked, you know, we kind of go along with that series, but we've never really presented it in that way of saying it. It's, it's a little different than sometimes what we think about, well, yeah, we're just, we're just helping people. Well, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't even help ourselves. Sometimes it causes us more problems because of what we're saying, what we're doing, according to what we just heard earlier by the Word of God. So go ahead, then. Ephesians 5 and 15. So be careful how you live, not as fools, but as those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. Don't act, don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. Then you will sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. And you will always give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit and allow Him to control. And this is again when you will then you will sing with hymns and songs and spiritual songs, making music to the Lord in your heart. See, the whole key part is you can sing all you want, but if it's not from the heart, the heart is the whole thing. Anything that happens, people will say. Well, what's this going on or that going on? I'll, I'll turn around and I ask. It depends on the heart. It depends on the heart. Because once the Holy Spirit, once Jesus you know, died on the cross, it flipped over from words and from actions and deeds into the heart, into the physical or spiritual. The spiritual has to do with the heart. Everything about the heart. That's, I like with uh, Mike, not Warnke, but... Uh, no, the other guy, yeah. From, oh, the Gaither brothers. Yeah, Mark Lowry. How he talked about the time. He says, the old, in the Old Testament, the term of endearment was your bowels. But see, and today we talk about the heart. So he says, could you imagine a song, I Left My Bowels in San Francisco? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yeah, I love you with all my bowels. <laughs> it's a little different concept. But see, back then it was all works and, and, and uh, law, and now it's, it's the spirit, it's the love, it's from the heart. And, and this is so important about making music from your heart. You know, many times we'll be sitting there and be praying and, and I'll just be singing a song and won't even be thinking about it. It's like the time I always said that I was at one place I was working at, and I went 30 foot up on a man lift, running around testing it. And the next day, I came into work, and the boss walked up and says, Were you singing out there yesterday? I says, I might have been. I don't remember. I was just up on this lift going back and forth and testing it out because I had done some work on it. They said, Well, there's a lady that was... I said, why did I offend somebody? She said, there's a lady next door in a building, and I know the doors were closed. And she says, she heard you singing a song that she knew from church a long time ago. And she says, it touched her heart. Now, how in the world did she hear a song when the motor's running on a, on a lift and I'm 30 foot in the air when she's in a building with the doors closed, the windows are closed? But see, it's God. You don't know what you're going to do. You start letting the heart... God move through your heart and start to just release the things that are happening. What is he going to do with it? Who's he going to touch? You know, it's just like the girls that you're talking about, the, the team. 
you know, just go, stopping by and talking to them and encouraging them and, and uh, the power of God and, and telling them that Jesus loves them makes a big difference. It's the heart. When you do it from the heart, God will move people's lives. It's awesome when that happens. Go ahead, dear. Ephesians 5 and 21, spirit-guided relationships with the wives and husbands. And it reads, and further, you will submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You wives will submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He gave his life to be her savior. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives must submit to your husbands in everything. Verily I say unto you, Nah, sorry, that's not it. <laughs> that's Matthew. You don't want me to read Matthew 18? Okay. So, this has always been a, a big one, and especially when we worked with uh, Married for Life, that the women have to submit themselves to the husbands. And what happens is, you can come up with a lot of different concepts, thinkings, teachings, understandings, and everything else. Well, so I went back in there and I says, okay, you know, well, uh, I've got it pretty well understood what I'm going to talk about. But I just wanted to go to see what, you know, it says submit yourself. So I said, looked up submit in the concordance. This is what it says. Inserted word. This word was added by the translator to better read or for better readability in the English. There is no actual word in the Greek text. Whoa! <laughs> that kind of threw me for a loop. I says, there's no Greek word in text. So I said, because that's why I like to find out these things and see what's actually going on because it does help me sometime. But I went back and I started to look up and it did say that uh, we were subject. Let's see, where was that at? This was that we were subject to Christ. It didn't actually say submit, but it said subject to Christ. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a little different. So I went back up and I looked at subject. And uh, it means basically the same thing as submit means. These are one of the areas that I've had a little problems with trying to get organized for today, so please forgive me. Normally I don't have that problem, but this one here was one of those deals. Uh, the King James, one of them was to be under obedience put under, subdued unto, uh, subject, to be put in, subjection, and submit unto. That's basically what it was saying, even being subjective to. If you go back and read that, it, it all says that when you come into it, that it, if we, you know, submit or subject ourselves to Christ, how is Christ going to treat the church? Christ actually gave us a free will. He said these are the things we're supposed to do by the word that he has, and he's going to allow us to go out and do those things. When we started to deal with this issue with Married for Life, it talked about agreement. Yes, the husband is the head. And I want to go to Numbers uh, 30.10. And that was in the New Living Testament. I've got both there on the paper. That second one there on the back. Did you have that one, dear? No. I don't think so. I'll read this one. November, uh, you know, it's Numbers 30, 10. And that's New Living Testament. Suppose a woman is married and living in her husband's home when she makes a vow or a pledge. If her husband hears of it and does nothing to stop it, her vow or pledge will stand. And if her husband refuses to accept it on the day that he hears it, her vow and her plan 
will be nullified and the Lord will forgive her. So her husband may either uh, confirm or nullify any vow or pledge that makes to deny or uh, I have to run that by. So her husband may either confirm or nullify any vow or pledge that makes to do, deny herself. But if he says nothing on the day he hears it, then he is in agreement with it. If he waits more than one day, then he tries to nullify a vow or a pledge. He will, after the consequences, or he will suffer the consequences of her guilt. These are the regulations of the Lord Moses concerning relationship between man and his wife and between a man and a young da daughter to whom life at, or lives at home. Now, it sounds kind of strange in, in this actual scripture. I went back and studied that out. And it basically means that if a wife comes in and wants to do something and, and the man says, okay, it's all right, and she does it and it's wrong, then the man's guilty. He gets whacked for it because he's put in that position. See, there's a relationship, especially in the older time, when the, the man was definitely had the relationship to God and then the woman was directly into the man. Now, that's true today, but it's not as true because when Christ came down, we're all one in the Spirit. So now what happens is we can take and actually go and have uh, we're all one in the spirit. And that's why we've seen so many times with like Sharon Bunnell and many other people, other women that have turned around and, and been in ministry because they are called by the Lord because we're one in the spirit. Every woman, every man can have a gifting. It's not just the men, it's women too. And they have a gifting. But when Sharon, you know, turns around, she said that her husband was their head and he agreed with everything that she was doing and allows her to go out and praise for her when she does. It's the same thing with uh, some other lady you know, ministers out there that are married. It's their husband are in agreement. That's what it is. God will bless them. But if they step out and do something that's wrong and the husband's not in agreement, then there's a problem that comes in and it creates a, an issue. And I haven't really... I was going to get into this too far today. I just want to kind of bring some things up. But especially with that one there, there is a, a precedence that the Lord is accountable and made the man accountable for everything that happens in the home. But the problem is men take that and beat it over their wives. They become very, you know, to the point. I remember sitting at a, uh, it was down at the, uh, one of the hospitals, and this guy, he was irate. He was on the phone talking to his, his wife, and where are you at, and what are you doing, and why are you doing this? I mean, you could tell how controlling he was. He could go out and sound like he'd go out and do whatever he wanted and where he wanted to go and have as much fun as he wanted to, but his wife was locked down. It was like a truck driver one time. We were at a restaurant. This guy was in there, and we were eating with him because he brought some stuff to the dealership I was at. And he was a big guy about like me with his belly hanging out and pretty grungy looking. And he, and he was talking about, yeah, I got my wife at home. She's pregnant barefoot and doesn't have a car, can't go anywhere. I'm thinking, wow, what a nice life. But see, this, this process when you start to say submit, when the wife needs to submit to the man, immediately the devil jumps in there and tries to make it something other than it is. I just want to put that out right now because what happened, yes, there is a spiritual law that goes along with that. But at the same time, in the New Testament, now we'll go back there to that Matthew 18, 18-20, if you want to read that one, dear. I believe you have that one, don't you? Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Praise the Lord. It says, 
that if two of you shall agree on earth in touching anything, I want you to understand there's two of you in a marriage. We, uh, in Married for Life, ended up having a demonstration. And what they did was they'd have a husband and wife stand together and their legs that were touching, they would take and put a rope around or tie their leg up. He said, now walk. And they tried to walk. And it was like, whoops. <laughs> it didn't work very well. In fact, this one couple really got wild. She was walking and the guy turned around and tried to run the other way and they all went down on the floor. But see, that's somehow how times we do it. As marriages, we're supposed to work together. We're supposed to walk together. We're supposed to be one together. And a lot of times it doesn't happen that way because somebody takes the authority or the other one wants to do this or the other one wants to do that. This is one thing that the Lord had showed me a long time ago. In the church today, or the one that I've been in before, what was happening was they would take the, uh, the couples and they would have, you know, somebody wanted to teach. So they go over and they start teaching on a Sunday school and another person was wanting to do something. So before long, the whole couple was divided. And a division was starting to grow within that, that couple because this person was wanting to do this and the other person was wanting to do that. And before long, they grew apart. They were never taking the couple and making them as one and trying to work together in a, a one flesh ministry. Now, th that's kind of hard to do, but you can do it. And I said there was a division that was coming amongst the couples just because of that issue. And I said, wow, but see, the thing is, when you get to a point and understand that you've got uh, two of you, and it says, if two of you agree on anything in touching what they shall ask, it shall be done by them of the, my Father which is in heaven. And I just want you to know one thing. We taught about agreement. Yes, we understand about husband, you know, wife submit to the husband. I have no problems with that. As long as the husband is godly and allowing the wife to be the person she is, to help her grow, to help her prosper, because that's what Jesus is doing for us. He says the same as Jesus is doing to the, his, his church, and that is he's allowing us to grow. He's allowing us, he has given us gifts. He's doing things for us. He's giving us the ability to change. But in Married for Life, what they talked about was agreement. There's many times you can make agreements. There are many ways you can make agreements. One is, I know more, we're going to go buy a car. And I know more about the cars. Well, you or even the other person might say, well, you know more about cars. What car do we need? But see, instead of taking and going before the Lord and asking God, Father, what car do we need? Asking, is it all right to have this car? I've seen this before where people will buy a car and one person says, oh, I've loved that car. I love that car. We just want that car. Well, the other one wasn't really involved in it, but because the one said they loved the car so much, they bought the car. The car turned around, find out about six months later, I hated that car. I don't know why they bought that car. That was the worst car we ever had. Whoops. You were the one that wanted it. No, they wanted it. Had the same thing happen with a house. Oh, this house. I want this house so bad. I'm thinking, oh, I pray they don't get that house. That house is so bad. It was my parents. I'm telling you right now, it's my parents. Because my mom was rejected. Because she was abandoned. And what happened was, they bought this one house. I mean, it was a wild house. It would not have been good for them. My mom wanted it so bad. She was so mad, my father would not buy that house. And I'm saying, they're both gone. They're both in heaven. They're doing good now. But I'm thinking, wow, I hope they don't buy that house. That's the worst thing they could ever do. Oh, man, she was so mad, so mad, so mad. So finally, they found another house. Well, we want this house. So she bought that house. And she was never satisfied with that house either. But that's what happens when people get in uh, this mode and see when they had, if they'd taken and prayed with the Lord to find out exactly what, what was best for them. But they never did. They didn't understand. Most couples don't understand. They used to usually go by, well, you know better, you just do it. You find the right one. No, let's take some time. Let's pray. Let's find out if we're in agreement, if God's in agreement. Because if God's in agreement, guess what? 
He won't be wrong. But see, you're submitting yourself under your husband, but the husband is also submitting himself under the Lord to protect his wife. And that isn't always happening. So what happens is, and it's not always easy, but there, because we always have different viewpoints, different situations that are going on. But the more we act and work towards agreement now, I'm going to take a little more time next week and I'm going to hit this a little more intense because I wasn't quite prepared for this part today. I've been trying. It's just like uh, the enemy has been out there trying to ruin this day, ruin this part because it's so important. But it was just amazing that God was saying that we need to change and we need to be one way. We need to be in such tune with the Holy Spirit today because as things come our way, we need to know. We need to be willing to do. We need to be willing to go because it's a crucial time, more crucial than I've ever seen before. It's always been crucial, but it's more crucial now than it ever has been. The enemy's out there. He's coming after us. He's wanting to break down the churches. We've been praying over this area here and praying that uh, the angels are around and blind the eyes of those who have come to kill, steal, and destroy. Um, you know, Debbie's even said, and I agree, that uh, we're over in this area. It's kind of the business area, so don't we look like a normal church, church area? A lot of people don't know we're here. We could have pickets. We could have all kinds of things going on. We could have people yelling and shouting and doing things that we come into church and you know we just want to bind those spirits break them down and get rid of them so we want to walk in the authority of God and understand it's not to hurt them but just to get them to where they're not going to bother us plus the fact is show them the love of God and, and uh, get them set free so father in the name of Jesus we come before you we thank you for this day we thank you for helping me get through this process and Father, we also apologize for not maybe totally be ready for the very last part of that scripture. But we know that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we will be ready next week to finish this thing up. And we thank you, Father, for all that you're doing. We know, Lord, that you are moving and changing and shaking. Things are going to happen. And Father, we just pray that as they do, that everybody will take and pray and seek what's going on and find out what is happening is just like with Shane that was here and we spoke to him about some things and we had a video that he sent and he said he went before the Lord and he started praying he asked about some situations and all of a sudden he said the Lord said everything's fine he's got it in control that's what we should know today no matter what's going on no matter what's happening we need to Realize that God's got it under control. Now, how can we best show our light into that area? How can we best use the Word of God? How best can we think? When things go bad, we have to sit back and say, we need to think about stuff. It's like going into an MRI. You need to think about the beach. You don't want to think about the bang that's going in your head. You need to think about what's good. You need to think about how God is so awesome. He's going to protect you. He's going to give you, if you have claustrophobia, you've got to turn around and really trust the Lord to go through that thing because it gets pretty tight sometimes. The fact is, when you start to think about those good things, then God starts to give you the ability to make it. So in all situations that we're going through, look at the good, not the bad, and see what God will show you. You'll be amazed. And you'll make it through a lot faster and a lot quicker than you've done in the past. So, Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And we thank you for all that you're doing. We thank you for the protection. And we just give you full glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Father, bless each and every one until we meet again. Amen.